It's really an honor to be here and with such great speakers. I'm just, it's, it's really exciting. Um, I'm an environmental health scientist at Consumer Reports. I'm also a mom of two small kids, three and five years old, just navigating the New York City public school system and the lunch program. Um, I, <clears throat> so I come at this both from a personal and a professional perspective. I've been at Consumer Reports for about 13 years and I actually star started there evaluating labels and labels on food. Um, but this talk is not going to focus on credible labels today, which we think are really important. Um, credible labels we think are the way forward. They are the way to create demand for better production systems. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today. I'm actually going to talk about the threat to those credible labeling systems and what we collectively need to do to demand uh, that these labels can compete fairly in the marketplace um, and that we can move the mass market forward. So I'm going to tell you three things. One, consumers will pay more for labels that they think add value. And consumers are also misled to believe that some labels are meaningful and that that dilutes consumer demand and it dilutes moving the marketplace forward. So I'm going to give you a little talk about labels and fables and uh, it sounds like a tale of despair by the time we get to the end of it, but I want to have this kernel of hope that we collectively in this room and outside of this room have the power to overcome this. Um, so we've asked Congress to create a level playing field when it comes to labels. There isn't one. There's not a floor for what labels actually have to mean in the marketplace in order to be out there. Um, so have you seen this label before? Anyone? It's not the tea in Boston. Um, <laughs> But I made it up. I made it up this week. And <laughs> it's actually that easy to come up with a label. And I can stick it on anything, and I can sell it in the marketplace. <clears throat> but that's not, <laughs> my goal is not to create a new label this week. But, but to show you that T really stands for the codes of conduct we think labels need to have. They need to be truthful. They need to be transparent, and we need to be able to trust labels in the marketplace, and, and all labels should be held to these same three codes of conduct. So I'm going to take you through about 10 labels in the next nine and a half minutes. Um, <clears throat> the natural label. There is more wrong with the natural label than is right with it. I think most of the people in this room know that. <clears throat> Manufacturers can literally decide what they want to mean by using that label. They can decide when they want to use it, and they can use it to mean what they want it to mean or what they think you want it to mean. Um, and that's very different from organic. And while there's issues with organic, uh, there's 600 pages of standards behind them. It's a regulated program. There's a framework to amend it. There, it's verified. And yet, poll after poll show that consumers confuse natural with organic all the time. In fact, some polls show that consumers think natural means more. So that's something we can do something about now. We, we need to stop buying that label. We need to stop relying on it. We think the government should actually do away with that label altogether. It's vague and meaningless. The next label, fresh, wow, that should, <laughs> that should mean something. So despite the fact that water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, the standard for fresh in chicken is actually 26 degrees Fahrenheit. So that means you can basically use a fresh label on a frozen chicken and sell it as fresh. And just to make the point, staff from our California advocacy office actually went bowling with fresh chicken broilers <laughs> on the steps of the state capitol in Sacramento. So, <clears throat> and yet, how easy would it be to actually change that standard so it really did mean something? Free range, how sad free range is, because for a label that should really mean something, and people think they understand this label, I do reports on free range all the time. For the last 13 years I've done it. Um, it just doesn't mean anything. It means that the animals have the option to go outdoors for an undetermined period of time. Uh, that isn't truthful. That doesn't mean the animals went outdoor. It doesn't mean they freely ranged. 
Um, again, we think that that's not acceptable. And the fact that the government provides a little bit of guidance behind that actually hurts the process. It actually prevents manufacturers from being held uh, to providing a truthful claim. Transparency. So transparency can apply to labels um, where they don't explain what they mean. But I want to talk about transparency in a different context. Genetically engineered, so foods like corn, soy, sugar beets, um, most of them are genetically engineered. None of them are required to be labeled. And yet our polls show that 95% of consumers want GE foods to be labeled. And as that little boy told us at the beginning, there are so many more questions about the safety, both to humans and the environment with genetically engineered foods, um, that there, and there isn't an adequate process to review those. Right now, GE Salmon is pending approval with a veterinary committee, a veterinary drug committee with the Food and Drug Administration, and the science is woefully inadequate for whether that fish is safe or not. In fact, we at Consumers Union have a lot of concerns about the paucity of science that is going into that safety assessment. So it's really strange considering 95% of people want it labeled, and considering if you cook, freeze, smoke, homogenize, make from concentrate, or don't. If you do that, the government requires you to label your food as such. So if you genetically tinker with the DNA, you don't have to label it. It's ridiculous. That should be labeled. <laughs> Mad cow tested. Anyone seen it? <laughs> no. So. A uh, couple years ago when we had the mad cow scare, <clears throat> Uh, the FDA did some work tightening up some feed loophole, uh, tightening up some feed uh, requirements. They took out most of the high risk materials from feed, but they left some loopholes in place. So Japan decided they weren't going to take our beef. And a company called Creekstone Farm decided that they wanted to test their beef for the mad cow prion, and they wanted to label it as such, and that way Japan would take that beef. <clears throat> but the USDA, the US Department of Agriculture, refused to let them do that. And they based it on the grounds that the test that they were going to use was going to be inadequate and wouldn't, su wouldn't suffice. And yet, that is the exact test that the USDA uses to survey for mad cow disease. It's <laughs> remarkable that the government would not let this company use that label on its product and actually add some value. Carbon monoxide added, seen that? No. So there's another one. A lot of uh, uh, case-ready ground meat can be treated with carbon monoxide. Uh, it preserves the red color just like it does when it asphyxiates us. It, it binds to the hemoglobin. It preserves the red color. Studies we did at Consumer Reports show that meat um, that's treated with carbon monoxide can actually spoil and the red color just stays the same, so you think it looks fresh. And while that's not the worst safety concern, what you should know is that carbon monoxide is considered to be a processing aid or a secondary food additive at the Food and Drug Administration, which means you don't have to label for it. It's kind of ridiculous. We need to get more conscious of those things being used in our food system that are nowhere near the ingredient panel. <clears throat> Finally, country of origin labeling. This was a law that went into place in the 2002 Farm Bill. It took years to get implemented for meat, seafood, produce. Um, <clears throat> in 2009, it finally got implemented and our meat started being labeled. A lot of it had multiple countries of origin because our animals are born, raised, and slaughtered in different countries, so consumers would see that. We think that was a good thing. That helps educate consumers about what's going on with our meat production system. In 2010, Canada and Mexico filed suit at the World Trade Organization against this. And just recently, in 2011, at the end, the World Trade Organization ruled in favor of Canada and Mexico. This law is in peril for us, and it has to do with international complaining that uh, it's really not a good thing for trade. Um, that's something that's in litigation now. We think the uh, government should be appealing that, um, but it's something to keep our eye on. Trust. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about the lack of trust, uh, corn sugar. So this is a move by the corn refiners to redefine high fructose corn syrup. They have filed a petition with the FDA to change the name of high fructose corn syrup on the ingredient panel to corn sugar. They've started a website called cornsugar.com. You can go and learn all about corn sugar. Um, 
we actually, along with uh, National Consumers League and Consumer Federation, met with the FT, uh, FTC, Federal Trade Commission, which deals with advertising, and said, what the F, why should they be able to use this when they don't even have an approved petition to change the ingredient claim? So the government's now told the corn refiners, you can't put TV ads up on corn with sugar right now, but that petition is still pending. And we want to make sure that the corn refiners do not get approval to change the name of high fructose corn syrup. Safe or not, we need to know what it is. Consumers know what it is. It shouldn't be called corn sugar. Cold pasteurized. Um, Winona, you know this well. Uh, we've, we've worked with Food and Water Watch a lot on this claim. Uh, this is an attempt by the American Meat Institute in a series of attempts to stop labeling their meat as irradiated. So they want to call it cold pasteurized. There was actually a petition that got denied to call it that. Um, irradiation is not thermal. It's not held to the same bacterial reduction standards as pasteurization. It's not the same thing. Um, we've held that back, but there'll be more, and so we all need to be watching and be vigilant about these attempts to undermine the labeling. This is a sad one. Um, so my five-year-old boy, I'm going to admit, loves hot dogs. I can't stand it, but he loves hot dogs. And so I thought this was the solution, no nitrates. So nitrates are used to cure meat. They leave residues on products, some nitrate residues. Those nitrosamines and processed meats have been associated with various different types of cancers. So wouldn't you think if you bought that claim, it didn't have nitrates? It's not the case. Um, here's what I learned. The government requires that companies who use natural nitrates, same chemistry, same curing as a synthetic nitrate, if they cure with a natural nitrate, they are required to list on their package uncured, no nitrates or nitrites added except for those that naturally occur in salt. Salt doesn't have nitrates. And it's celery powder, it's onion powder, it's lactic acid starter that all work. Whatever it is, it's a cured meat product. It is an uncured, and it also has nitrates. Companies like Applegate, Organic Prairie, have all publicly said, this is ridiculous. We don't want to label our products with this, and yet they have to. So this is something we need the government to do to stop this arcane labeling and get on with it. So as we get on the road, there are labels out there that are getting on the road. Organic sometimes veers off, but there's a framework. There are two meetings a year. We all need to get more involved in those meetings because we have the ability to watchdog that, and that's the hope. That's the demonstration of feasibility in the marketplace that sustainable food production practices can work. We need organic to survive. We need it to succeed. So while marketing is a powerful, powerful tool out there, I would just tell you all after this tale of despair that consumer demand's more powerful, and Bob alluded to it. We have the power to change this through what we buy, through what we say, through the questions we ask. We have the power to change that. So bring the food fight on. Thank you. Thank you.